Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the living light who transformed darkness into light. Through the blessing of this glorious Sunday, make us worthy to praise you with all those who saw the radiant light of your resurrection. We worship and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the living one who by his death gave life to his creation. By his resurrection he saved his church, gave joy to his flock, brought us back to his Father, and enriched us with the gifts of his Spirit. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Only begotten Son, you were born of the Father before all ages, and by your creative will you separated light from darkness. On this, the first day of the week, you fashioned all creation to honor Adam, the image of your majesty. We praise and thank and celebrate, proclaiming, Blessed are you, for you appeared in the flesh on earth like us, and you lived among us. Blessed are you, for you were buried and counted among the dead, and you shined your light in the sadness of the tomb. Blessed are you, for you rose to life, giving good hope to all, and you filled the angels with radiance, and they appeared at your tomb like flashes of lightning. Now, O Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make us worthy to rejoice in the glory of your radiant resurrection. Breathe life into our departed and make them worthy to stand at your right hand in your eternal light that you have prepared for those who love you. With them we praise and thank you for all your graces and glorify you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, forever.
O Lord, accept the fragrance of our incense and our prayers, and may we become a sweet fragrance through our good works and actions. Hear our petitions and grant rest to our departed in your dwelling place of joy. O Lord, our God, to you be glory forever. Shout with joy from the mountains, Sunday is a feast so great. Offer praise to the Lord God, and with angels celebrate. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. <clears throat> Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. <clears throat> May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, so we are ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him be sin who did not know sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Working together, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I heard you, and all the day, on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is a very acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We cause no one to stumble, stumble in anything in order that no fault may be found with our ministry. On the contrary, in everything we commend ourselves as ministers of God, through much endurance in afflictions, hardships, constraints, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, vigils, fasts, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, in a Holy Spirit, in unfeigned love, in truthful speech, in the power of God. With weapons of righteousness at the right and at the left, through glory and dishonor, insult and praise. 
We are treated as deceivers and yet are truthful, as unrecognized and yet acknowledged, as dying and behold we live, as chastised and yet not put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet enriching many, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Evangelist Luke writes, Jesus then returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news of him spread throughout the whole region. He taught in their synagogues, and he was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had grown up, and he went, according to his custom, into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and he was handed a scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and the recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue looked intently upon him. And he said to them, today, this scripture passage has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the truth, peace be with you. And Jesus returned in power of the Spirit into Galilee. And the fame of him went out through all the whole country. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. 
If you recall a few months ago, we talked about the distinction, or perhaps more than a few months ago, the distinction in the question of time. The distinction between chronos for the Greeks, the classical world, and kairos. Chronos, of course, being the sequential time, and kairos being time, but in the sense of the opportune moment, the moment that we receive now. Feast days are kairos. Monday through Saturday is chronos. And so in the notion of time, this is the way the whole work of the gospel is being presented. This is why when St. Paul speaks about the coming of the Messiah, he speaks of it as being the fullness of time. And it's also why in the gospel and in the writings of St. Paul, we speak about the fact that we already live in the end times. We already exist now at the end of the world. It's because what comes down from the heavens, this proclamation of the gospel, is portrayed as kairos. What we lived in the morning the people came into the synagogue in the gospel today, that was chronos. They got up in the morning, they prepared themselves for the day, and they went to the synagogue. But what our Lord announces to them is this gospel from the prophet Isaiah. This is the vision of what the gospel is. Too often in the modern world, we see Christianity as being something about to make you virtuous. Now, doubtless, we're meant to be virtuous, but that's not the purpose of Christianity. Christianity does not come to the world in order that we just simply become better citizens. Since the French Revolution, that's been the defense of Christianity in many quarters. But it's false. It's not the fundamental vision of what Catholicism actually is. And so today what we have with us is the beginning of the Gospel of St. Luke. Chapter 3 is on our Lord's baptism. And the temptation that he undergoes, three, chapter 3 and 4, he undergoes with the devil that we know, these stories. And then, of course, St. John tells us that after the 40 days fast, our Lord performs his first sign in Cana of Galilee. St. Luke doesn't talk about the first miracle. He just says that after the 40-day fast, our Lord went around to the various synagogues and he taught. And he also worked miracles. And so St. John points out to us in his gospel that the first miracle, the first sign, was in Cana of Galilee. So that's what this means at the beginning of the gospel today, that it says, and then our Lord returned in the power of the Spirit to Nazareth. So he returns now to Nazareth where he grew up. Everyone knows our Lord. Right? He's grown up among them. And it's where our Lord is going to say famously that no man is a prophet in his own country. No one listens. I don't go home and convert my family. They know me too well. They just simply ignore what I have to say. Oh, they like me, but that's about it. As a priest, leave it in the door. That's fine. And our Lord finds exactly the same experience in Nazareth. When he comes back, it's a very simple story today. The focus is upon what he's announcing in this prophecy of Isaiah. To mention to you, the prophecy of Isaiah is enormously long. It's one of the biggest books in the scriptures, 61 chapters. And this that is read today is from the 61st chapter. So it's the very end of the prophecy of Isaiah. It's the vision of what the Messianic age is going to bring, Kairos. What is the time of the Messiah? And that's what, this is a very simple exchange. Our Lord goes to the synagogue, as he's always gone to the synagogue on Saturday. And he's there. And in the synagogue, it's amongst the men who have been bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah is a ceremony, means that you are now son of the law, which allows then that male to read the scriptures in the assemblies that they have every Saturday. And that's why our Lord, for whatever reason he's been chosen, he's the one who's going to read on this specific Saturday. And the attendant who's governing the ceremonies brings the scrolls from the Torah. He brings them out, presents them to our Lord. But we notice that it's our Lord who's looking for the text that he wants to read. We're told that he opens it up and he searches. So it may not be the text they're expecting, first of all. That's one detail to notice. You know, us, it's the same book. Next year, on this ninth Sunday, you're going to have the same reading in August or July of 2020. 
And so this is the way the synagogues usually work. So the first detail we note is our Lord's looking for something different. And then he reads this great prophecy that you have in the bulletin today. And what he presents is this acceptable time. St. Paul talks about it in the second letter to the Corinthians, which is why that's the reading earlier from the epistles. But it begins by saying that the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, this messianic prophecy. And that I have been anointed, I have been set aside, consecrated to bring, to preach, to teach. This essence that what this kingdom is, is a learning. It clarifies the mind. It clarifies the spirit. Subsequently, it, is, it will clarify our actions because the way we see, as we always say, the way we see is the way we judge, and the way we judge is the way we act. So the clarification of the mind, though, is first. You can't just jam people to tell them they have to act in a certain way. If they don't judge that it's the good way to act, then they won't judge that it's the good way to act if they don't see things with a clarity of mind. And hence, you're watching the unraveling of the Western world around us because we no longer see or judge the way our ancestors saw or judged. It's why the bulletins are long, as I try to give you a vision that when we approach things like abortion, what we actually should be looking at in all the details. It's not just about the death of a baby. It's a much larger and more complex picture, which is why we have to look beyond slogans. It's a clarification of the mind, the way we judge, and the way we judge is the way we act. And so the spirit of the Messiah, the spirit of the Lord upon the Messiah is a setting aside of an anointing in order to teach, in order to preach. And the first thing that he gives are these qualifications, I have been sent to the oppressed, I have been sent to the poor to bring them glad tidings. That freedom is being brought to you by unshackling the mind from illusion, from darkness. Go back and look at the first prayers we have of today's Mass. When it talks about on the first day you separated light from darkness, it's not just talking about creation. But in the new light of the resurrection, you also separate light from darkness. You give us the ability to see in the world which has fallen. And this world will always remain fallen until the manifestation of our Lord. So there's always going to be the clash between that aspect of darkness within the world and the preaching of the light of the gospel. But our Lord says that they are good tidings because they give you the ability to see that there is a future. We're not just born into a world of frustration where you just simply dance on the stage for a while, as Shakespeare said, and then just disappear. That there is a value to human life that God has created, and it's not just simply for here below. And so he goes on to say that it is to preach and to announce deliverance to captives, those who are shackled by this world of darkness, those who are shackled by the mere concerns of this world. That's captivity. And he says that in the midst of all this, that what it is is to bring sight to the blind, those who do not see. And the not lack of seeing that vision is, which is gone. And in the Old Testament, we're told in the prophets that without vision, the people perish. And so that our Lord is announcing this clarification of mine in order to set at liberty what is bruised and what has been bound up. Now the last line you have in the gospel is actually not from 61. It's a reference to Leviticus chapter 25, which is called the Jubilee. Now we know the word Jubilee. It's usually a way to sell stuff at a grocery store or something. But a Jubilee, the word we have in English, harkens back to the Hebrew word for the trumpets that were blown at the beginning of a year. And in the law of Moses, every 50th year was a jubilee year. And the jubilee year was a year of restoration. So one of the things that was done, for example, if during that half century you had bought property from a different family, a different tribe in Israel, at the end of those 50 years, that property went back to the ancestral homelands. The debts which were owed were abolished in the jubilee year. And the slaves in Israel, they were let free in the Jubilee. All of this vision, for the law of Moses, it was to keep a stability within the community. 
So they would not just simply be swamped over by the Canaanite population that surrounded them. So it was always to keep intact Israel as a people. That's the main reason for Jubilee. But of course, everyone noticed that part of it was also the freeing of slaves, the abolition of debts that you had to pay. There was a great liberty that was brought during that year of restoration, once every 50 years. So basically, you may see it once in your lifetime, a jubilee. And so in this whole vision, Saint, our Lord is adding to it another section of Isaiah. It's still all the prophet Isaiah, but that the Messiah comes to preach an acceptable year to the Lord. This is the Jubilee. We bring you freedom. When we have that vision of what our religion truly is, it's liberating as it's meant to be because it makes us free mentally. We're not shackled by simply social media and by the television and by CNN and Fox and everything else. Who cares? If their ideas jive with Christianity on occasion, which they do, eh, yeah, not very often, but sometimes, if they do, well, good for them. The church has an entire vision of human society. It has a vision of the freedom and the clarification of the mind that is given to us. And that is a very beautiful way to look at the gospel. But because our Lord has chosen this text, it wasn't what they were expecting when he hands off the scroll. And when the scrolls are rolled up, they're also covered with tapestry. And when you read the pages, you never touch the pages of the Torah. They have this large stick, and the end of it usually has like a little hand with a finger pointing out. And you use this to read. Part of it, of course, is their manuscripts. You keep running your finger over them, you're leaving finger oil into the, into the parchment. And part of it just became that this is the text of the Word of God, it should not be touched. So that when the scrolls, to this day they still use scrolls, you never touch the pages in any way, and you roll them back up, and then you cover them in this brocade. And that's what you hand back to the attendant, and he places it back in the Torah. Now, when that's done, our Lord just sits down again, saying nothing. He's supposed to make a commentary on that text. And that's why we're told everyone that's in the synagogue is just looking at him intently. It's like, well, I mean, your sermons are usually too long here, but at least you'd expect something after the gospel. If I just walked on and sat down over here, you'd do the same thing. You kind of, well, we're expecting something. And after they're all looking at him, he just simply says his commentary is this day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, which makes them even more mystified. So what I leave you with is this last detail, which is not what we read in the gospel, what takes place immediately after. And it's clearly given to us in any of you by the mother of God herself. She would have been in the synagogue that day to watch this. It's not recorded in any other gospel. It's only in St. Luke. And St. Luke's foundation of those early years are all from Mary of Nazareth, given to St. Luke directly in interview. And so the people in Nazareth, we finish by this aspect. We've talked about a lot that we have illusions in our own spiritual lives personally. We have expectations of the way the world should go. When we're 20, it's just kind of the idea that the whole world is open to us to do whatever, and that's good. We all had that enthusiasm. And then after the world kind of beats us up over the next few decades, we kind of come back to a place of a little more of sobriety. But we still retain the illusions of the way God should be acting in my life. And we've talked about over these last weeks that the thing that we have to pray for each day of our lives is that God give us the grace and the strength and the faith to follow where providence will take us. We presume that we know what God wants from me five years from now or next year or even this year. But none of us can be sure of what that is. The breaking of shackles, the breaking of the bondage of this world is at the level of the mind. But part of that breaking is not just sin, it's the idea of the illusions that I live with which often make me not achieve the life of virtue and goodness that I would arrived at otherwise. 
And so what we pray for here is the ability to be able to go forward without illusion. And the reason why I bring this up is because we see what happens immediately with the people of Nazareth. This ticks them off. We think this is beautiful. This makes the people in the synagogue angry because you know what they've been thinking about? <clears throat> Do something good for us. We've heard all these stories in the other synagogues of Galilee. You're working miracles. Do something here for us. And then other people in the synagogue are like, we know this guy is the son of Joseph, a carpenter. Come on. We know him. He's not a miracle worker. No, but you heard the stories. Everyone's talking about this. No, not Yeshua, not this guy. We know him. And there's this contention back and forth. And our Lord winds up telling them, remember Elisha and Elijah, that when Elijah was sent to heal, when he healed the leper, there were many lepers in Israel. Who did he heal? He healed the, the general of the Syrians from Damascus, not even part of Israel. And there were many widows in the time of Elijah or Elisha. And he said, but none of the widows were given a miraculous food except for the woman who lived in Tyre, what's now southern Lebanon, she's not part of Israel. And they become even more angry because he's telling him, God's ways are not your expectations. And what the people in the, in the synagogue do is they riot against our Lord and they drag him out of the synagogue. It's the same Saturday. And they drag him over to the edge of the cliff that Nazareth is built on to throw him off of it, to kill him. So when we say, when our Lord says, no man is a prophet in his own country, it can become pretty dramatic. No, my family have not tried to kill me. But you can have this, though they don't want me to preach religion either at table. So when our Lord does this and tells us that the path of God are not your paths, now imagine that the Blessed Virgin Mary, the mother, his mother is sitting there in the synagogue watching them drag her son out of the synagogue in order to murder him. This is the very beginning of our Lord's ministry. This is how far illusion and self-centeredness and preconceived ideas in our own personal lives can lead us to this confrontation with the Lord God himself. And so we pray. We pray each day that God give us the grace to see, the desire to be freed, and the courage to be able to follow where providence leads us according to the beautiful light of the acceptable time and the year of the Lord in Kairos, because now is the moment of salvation. Not last week, not next week, this morning. And so we pray that our Lord frees us, brings us into this. And so then, then we understand what our Lord means when he says to them, this day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God.
Telvot madem heydar loko, halvotar loko da khali fagmi. Reynum sivot aykutar okeyudar baytok kistudet hayekro, halko da Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As you remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint John Marie Vianney. Remember, O oh God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered, for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. 
merciful and holy Lord and Father, and through your only begotten Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory to you and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, o holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. peace and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever Amen. O Lord we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim who sing with your voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify, and proclaim. Father, full of mercy, holy is your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and holy is your life-giving Spirit. You are holy and the giver of all that is good. For our salvation, your only begotten Son became flesh of the pure Virgin Mary, and by his divine plan he saved and redeemed us. Now 
Vaxoya del Tarmita o Kado Mara Sabahola Mehene Kulho Homo Denita Fahuro Diem Dachlof Baikun Wachlof Sagiem Metaposeo Metihel Hosoyan how may we hide in the alam alamin? Amen. O kano alkoso damsiho men hamro men mayo barho kade. Abil Talmida o Kado Mara Samishta wa Mehne Kul Khuhu Ono Denita Dimo Dilan Diya Tiki Khadato Dahlaw Khalpun Wahlaw Sagiyem Mekte Shadu Metihem Khulsoyab Chaume wa chaye nan alam alamin Amin Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup You do so in memory of me until I come again We remember your death, O Lord O oh Lord, lover of all people, we remember your plan of salvation, and we ask you to have mercy on your worshippers, and to save your inheritance when you appear at the end of time, to reward all people justly according to their deeds. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, O O oh Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O oh God, have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin monio, manin monio, manin monio, nite modro ho chayo kadisho, unachan alainu alu korbono ho no. By his descent he may make and spread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies, and the strengthening of consciences so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. We raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. We offer you, O Lord, this divine sacrifice for your church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Rashada Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith, with blameless lives and with purity and holiness, may they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name, 
we pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, your holy church that you established on the solid rock of the true faith and send her vocations to the holy priesthood and religious life. In a world of distractions, which pull us away from properly loving you and our neighbor, may those whom you have called to serve your holy church respond to you and have the courage to follow your will. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have presented these offerings. Forgive them so they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them. For you are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen the Archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest, hoping in you, awaiting that life-giving voice, calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf, and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. pleasing oblation, who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice, who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest, who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory. Compassionate Lord, may we, your lowly servants, be made worthy to pray with purity and holiness, and to call upon you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways. And do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us. For yours is the kingdom with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit, bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior who gives life to those who partake of it and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and holiness, that through them we may be forgiven and made holy, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your love, Lord God, and our souls purified by your forgiving love. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins, and for a new life, O Lord.